Hello everyone, time for another Wargaming update. I um, haven't actually painted any figures <laughs> recently. Um, you'll see why um, as I go through all this. I have been painting a lot but it's all, it's all been very um, space occupying. It's just covered my uh, worktop and uh, hasn't been room for any figures. Um, so first of all this is an Amtrak, it's the 3D printed model um, that I purchased from Butler's Printed Models um, and I'm pretty happy with this. Um, it's, a, it's a wargaming model definitely, um, not something um, to be bought and assembled as a display case kind of model. Um, there's lots of uh, not not uh, um, you know irregularities in it but just things you would expect from a 3D print um, on the underside places you can't see there's lots of um, sort of wormy uh, threads and things like that that you have to clear off but it's impossible to get them all off um, and it's 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 not easy to uh, get it looking so I mean for instance inside the the wheels and the rollers and things like that you have to get in there with a scalpel and really scrape it all out um, so and there isn't the amount of detail on it on the surfaces that you would get from a a plastic kit or something like that. Um, the machine guns, you know, if you look at those, they're very kind of they're just they're just column columns and tubular shapes and 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 so on and rectangles, cubes. Um, none of the uh, you know the very fine detail that you would get on a something that's been made from a plastic kit. Um, but for wargaming, I think this is absolutely brilliant. So don't take what I've just said as a, a criticism of it. I'm, I've, I've, this is going to look really good on the tabletop, I think, and um, you know, be be uh, for the first sort of uh, vehicle I've got for my U.S. Marines, which you know, I'm working on. So this is for my bolt action projects. Uh, decals also from. Butler's printed models and paint painting wise um, I wanted to get some paints that um, were fairly accurate so I went for um, I bought these uh, Vallejo model airbrush colors um, World War II US Marine Corps colors green and gray patterns 1942 to 1945 so the one I was particularly wanted to get um, was this sort of colour scheme here. So that uses the ocean grey um, paint from the bottle. And there it is. And now the, these are airbrush paints, so they're very thin. Um, and I don't have an airbrush. Um, I've never summed up the courage and uh, it's not something I've ever particularly wanted. Uh, my painting is a lot less uh, fine than a lot of people who, who paint out there and uh, you know I'm quite happy to stick to my old techniques with ordinary brush but being very thin um, it, it does need a lot of layers and um, it's quite flat, you know, when you put it on. So the, th the thing I thought was that um, if you look at Wargames Foundry's um, triads, there's a Storm Blue, which the light, this is the light version of the Storm Blue, and it's not too dissimilar from um, the Vallejo shade of ocean grey so I, I to get more depth into the paint 
I use <coughs> excuse me I use the um, first two shades of the triad so the shade which is the darkest one and then the middle one storm blue um, and then instead of using the light I painted over the top quite heavily um, so most of it was that sort of color so that that becomes the third shade in the triad and uh, I think I think the effect is pretty pretty close I try and get them side by side to uh, the color there and then um, I don't paint that many vehicles and, and tanks and so on but obviously um, couldn't just leave it uh, with the three you know looking pristine so I had to find a way of weathering it so that I went on and um, purchased some weathering pigments and so on from AK Interactive now um, with an amphibious vehicle I wasn't you know I was wondering what to do because um, obviously if it's just landed from the you know the beach landed onto the, on the beach then it's not going to uh, require lots of weathering in terms of dust and mud and so on <clears throat> um, uh, so I came up with the idea AK, AK Interactive have loads and loads of um, different types of weathering um, it's, it's incredible how you know how specialist how specialized some of their um, paints are but it struck me that it, this this is kind of halfway through from you know halfway between um, a ship and a tank uh, so I, I did ex I, I, I went I went along those lines so I bought um, for the tracks weathering on the tracks I bought track wash wash for tracks and then for the for all the kind of cogs and wheels and moving parts and so on I got a wash of a wash for shafts and bearings um, so that was the sort of land element um but then for the for the kind of naval side of it i i got um a naval <laughs> wash for gray decks now that is the primary um wash that you can see on on here and it's made it look i i think that was the that was the biggest success really because it, it's made it look worn and grubby um but at the same time the gray kind of matches the ocean gray of the of the vallejo color um so i was quite pleased with that and then finally and um one side of this model is more, it's more apparent it's very apparent on the back there um but there i got um salt streaks for ships so in other words um, it's seen a lot of campaigns and so on and uh, beach landings and uh, the salt in the in the seawater has kind of um, run down the sides of the of the of the vessel and uh, caused salt stains on it as well so I thought those four that was enough I mean I I could have purchased another easily another ten that would have you know been suitable um, but, but then it would have just got too much so um, that's my first bit of support for my US Marines okay now for the uh, Falklands War game that I'm planning um, painted a lot of these well rocky features that these are from timecast and they're uh, d designed for the Falklands War <coughs> um, timecast do a lot of 15 mil Falklands War buildings and so on and the rocks are meant to complement those <coughs> um, but obviously with rocks they they're suitable for uh, 20 mil as well or even 
28 or 10 mil um, they'd work fine for all of those so um, use the whole variety of paints on those um, too many to go into really um, just carried on applying colours until I thought I got something um, matching what I was going for and also painted up from many scale models the uh, camouflage netting covering these ammo crates um, this is 20 mil and uh, it's probably intended more for the second world war but I thought the camo netting in particular um, I was interested in getting uh, the ammo crates I might not might not use um, so that's uh, a little bit more scenery that I'll be able to use uh, for this Falklands War game which is probably I've probably got enough to play a game now in terms of scenery I've certainly got enough in terms of figures so that that should be coming to my channel fairly soon next up I painted uh, for my lacquered coffins games painted up another five ME 109s in 1 300th scale uh, these again are from Butler's printed models. Um, made a bit of a error when I was purchasing these um, in that I was intending to buy the high resolution models um, and these were the uh, cheaper low resolution ones. Um, I, I would certainly, uh, well I have bought some more now but I would I'd definitely prefer the the high res you, I mean you get what you pay for with the uh, the low res and uh, they look all right um, but they're not there's, you can definitely see a few more lines and so on on them and they also uh, they require gluing together they come in two halves um, so most of the time I manage to get them to uh, to fit together neatly but um, there are a few especially on the fins um, you can see where there were two parts to it I mean this is a I get it in the screen this is a high res one so from a distance they don't they don't look too different and they're perfectly suitable as gaming objects but um, I'm, as I say I, I prefer you know if, if what watch that if you do buy models from about the printed models that um, they, they give you two options a little drop down menu and it's it's easy to accidentally buy the cheaper cruder models if you if you're going for a high res then um, you have to sort of click on the drop down button next up then um, if I'm ever to get through all 200 of those plastic soldier company 1 300th scale models that uh, I purchased then um, I needed to get a factory line production process going so I just picked out as many hurricane models as I could find so I think I've found them all um, there's 47 of them um, random mix of planes so I ended up with a, a prime number that I'm not going to be able to break into equal groups but then again I'm hardly likely to ever play a game um, involving 47 hurricanes um, but I've got these done so um, it's made a significant in, inroad into the uh, into the bags um, next up I'll probably um, paint some German bombers one kind or another focus to show you but yeah it didn't take too long once um, as I say once you get a factory line process going next up then and also for lacquered coffins I've uh, 3d printed a couple of uh, RAF control towers to use as ground targets um, these uh, the STL files um, I got from I think I think they call themselves WOW it's W A W um, so it's either W A W or WOW um, 
they are pretty well because uh, they do a great or he does a great range of, of files um, some of them have their faults um, more on that in a moment um, but this this was um, a file that uh, is included I think it's called storm across Europe um, but you can buy it separately on his website um, if you're just interested in, in printing this model but that works out pretty expensive way of doing it you're much better off buying hundreds and hundreds of files of things that you're never likely to print up and have a library of them um, so there are two of them because I always print more than I need um, usually because there's a failure of something to print and um, you know I, I, out of the uh, resulting print run I will have uh, sufficient to make at least one model but in this case I decided to print two so I had spares and um, everything printed out all right including I mean it's really reduced down they're not they're not designed to be printed at six mil but even the um, you know the railings and everything worked out fine but well it didn't work out fine and and um, this is this is a problem that wow has is he's, he's he's a little bit hasty to um once the kickstarter is um completed is he's, he's over hasty to get it out there so that people can download the files who you know who've uh, supported his kickstart um and you often find that things are oversized um in the case of this RAF control tower um the he, he's used that there are basically is basically a number of prints i forget how many um i think the railings around the mid section are separate print and there's two stories and a roof for the uh, shed at the top um but basically he he, he's used for the floor in between it's got it's got everything you know if you if you were you printing it a larger size you could take the roof off and there's rooms and steps and corridors inside and everything but the internal dimensions of the floors are the same as the out exterior dimensions of the walls so they don't fit into one another and it meant um, that this that that middle kind of gallery balcony whatever you want to call it um, didn't fit around the building um, so I had to lift up the upper floor so I put some plastic card in there to raise it up and then just slotted the the gallery into the kind of gap that was left um, so it's kind of made it's given it, it, it doesn't show too badly but it that that sort of line is the plastic card and that 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 isn't there it, uh, is, that's not intended by the STL files you know designer to be there but it's it was the quickest way I could think of getting around it rather than um, you know I could have rescaled the 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 balcony but that would have been time consuming um, I thought I would do it this way and the same applies to both buildings um, one I painted up in camouflage one in ordinary green um, there seems to be a lot of uh, variety some of the some of the RAF camouflage was black brown, black and green um, some some sometimes the paint the buildings were just painted green um i think in a lot of cases they were they just use whatever paint they had to hand um and the other what's the other thing i'm it's oh yeah yeah um qu quick factoid for you these aren't actually if you're going to be um pedantic about it they're not actually raf control towers um because the raf didn't have control towers um the term control tower only came into use once the Americans had entered the war and the US Air Force um, had planes based in 
in, in on British aerodromes and airfields, and they called their control towers control towers. The RAF actually knew them as watch offices. Um, so if you if you're talking about the period of the Battle of Britain, strictly speaking, you should talk to the talk talk of them as watch offices. But everyone everyone speaks of them as control towers now. Um, you know the American expression has uh, entered the British language, the English language. Okay, so um, I think that's all the painting I've done. So now I'll just go on to a few purchases I've made. Well, it seems as though it's time to finally say goodbye to Tester's dull coat. Um, quite a few years back now, it became very difficult to to find. Um, there was a period where you just couldn't seem to purchase it anywhere. Um, and I never quite worked out why that happened, um, but it came back. Um, it's possible to buy it from various websites and uh, Amazon and so on. Um, so I just thought that was uh, a hiccup and uh, things had returned to normal. Um, I always buy about three cans at a time so that uh, I've got enough to last me a, a while. And this is practically empty now. You can hear the ball rattling around in there now. There's not much left in there. So um, when, when I get onto my last can, I usually start looking around. And um, places like Firestorm Games and, and that where I buy have bought testers from in the past all seem to have removed it from their website I just couldn't work out what was going on and uh, it looks like it, it has disappeared completely apart from America so I suppose I could always buy it from an American website and pay for the postage but um, I thought it was time to try and find because it's the second it's the second time that this has happened um, try and find an alternative that I could you know that's more reliable as a source and and this is the thing that um, you know I use testers as as a, a varnish but it strictly speaking it's it's a dull coat it's meant to it's meant to sort of flatten out and give everything a very nice um, matte appearance but it works fine as a as a varnish as well it protects you your figures um, and I, I just like it I think it was a very you know high 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 end quality product and it, it just doesn't make sense to me that a good something that is so good can can go out of business or <laughs> cease you know cease to be sold um, anyway the last time that happened um, I did I did have to try various others and I tried army painter matte varnish and I wasn't happy with it um, it seemed to give a sort of satin finish rather than the the very kind of matte dull matte that, that I like um, so this time around oh yeah the other thing the other thing that's always made me panic um, is is the terrible kind of Gosh, it must it must have been decades ago now when Humbrol changed their formula, and it just ruined absolutely ruined anything that you sprayed the varnish on. Um, but I've never trusted Humbrol since. Um, so this time round, I, I I could vaguely remember um, someone recommending this once, and it came up on a search for testers. Um, so I've gone with Winsor and Newton professional matte varnish, and um, some of those hurricanes were sprayed with this, and some with testers, and you can't really tell a difference. So um, this is going to be my uh, go-to matte varnish in the future. Okay, these were a charity shop find, um, two DVD documentaries um, on two battles of the English Civil War um, worth getting hold of they're only a quid each so I thought I'd add them to my uh, DVD library I've watched them both they're, they're, they're all right they're you know about 45 minutes to an hour long each and um, 
they use a lot of uh, sealed knot uh, participants to uh, represent the battle so it gives it a little bit of kind of realism rather than um, resorting to snippets from the very few films that are out there like Cromwell and so on um, they're a bit they're a bit sort of uh, dull I suppose you could call it um, you know they're, they're sort of uh, they have actors acting out um, various scenes council meetings and so on and um, you know it's a little bit kind of uh, second tier shall we say but but worth getting hold of you know interesting subjects and uh, as I say I'm pleased to get them and then um, I purchased as new um, this DVD that I'd, I'd never heard of before um, it's a BBC sort of dra drama documentary you might call it, it um, first light it came out in 2010 for the uh, that anniversary of the Battle of Britain and um, it's the story um, it's taken from the sort of memoirs of a RAF pilot called Geoffrey Wellham who um, actually appears in the film the film kind of cuts between scenes of him wandering around uh, in his, in the uh, place he settled in in Cornwall um, you know talking about his experiences and the effect that the Battle of Britain had on him but then it keeps jumping to a drama where this actor plays plays him Sam Hewan I suppose that must be um, and it's a pretty good watch you know there's um, very uh, there are very kind of uh, dramatic aerial footage of aerial warfare and so on and um, it, but it, it kind of um, it does stress a lot more the um, the impact that the uh, f fighting actually had on their uh, mental states and so on. Jeffrey Wellham himself eventually had a, a nervous breakdown um, during the war. Um, the the one thing uh, which all all sort of TV dramas do is kind of oversimplify the. The, the 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 narrative and the plot really so um you wouldn't know from watching this that um wellam only joined the battle of britain um in september that a lot of his combat experience um he was in um which flight group would it have been um he wasn't in 11 group you know, which was in the southeast of England. He was in the west of England, which was either twelve or thirteen. Um, and again, a lot of his uh, trauma took place after the Battle of Britain had ended. Um, there's a scene where he, he's um, flying in the rain, um, trying to find a, a, a German bomber. He's de determined to shoot it down. Um, but that actually happened over France um, much much later than the Battle of Britain so it, it kind of um, over over simplifies it to um, you know sort of to mark the fact that it was a it was an anniversary kind of uh, commemoration of the Battle of Britain um, but it's, you know a pretty it's a pretty good pretty good watch I could recommend this and then finally I couldn't resist this this was uh, one of uh, the naval and military presses uh, offers um, I think they were selling at half price um, and I'm just an absolute sucker for books like this this is a, a kind of reference book a compendium of um, details on not all but I think it's about 470 of the airfields in the UK that were used by either the RAF and or the USAAF during the Second World War. Absolutely gorgeous book, um, chock full of not only photographs but um, maps and plans and designs for. There's there's one there. So this is the uh, USAAF plan of I. Never even heard of that. Don't know where that is, but. Um, 
lots of things like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely gorgeous book. Um, not something that you can read from cover to cover because it's, as I say, it's just a list of details of the um, various airfields and um, <coughs> uh, you know the squadrons that serve there and so on. Um, but it's fa fantastic as a reference work, and I, I just love to collect books like this. Um, I just stop there because there's a photograph of a control tower there. <laughs> um, yeah, fantastic. And and one of the things um, I like about books like this is that um, if something crops up, um, you can um, you can just look it up in here. If so, if some, if if you need to sort of uh, quickly find a reference to a particular airfield or something, so. Um, I recently, I think it was back in January, um, got hold of my mother's service records. Um, she had been in the WAFs during the war and um, right towards the end of her life she was on the phone talking to me and um, you know, she's sort of reminiscing about the war years in a way. Her, I mean, her memory has, was really kind of failing her in some respect, but but in some respects, but in others not. And she she actually told me her she could remember her um, number, her service number. Um, so I made a note of it, thinking there's no way. You know, it's like a I can't remember about ten ten digits long. Um, and lo and behold, when I went to search for her records, she'd got it absolutely right. And this was when she was in her 90s. Um, but another thing that um, I really doubted that she was remembering accurately, because sometimes she came up with the most fantastic... Um, it's, it's called confabulations when, when um, you use... Um, when, you, when dementia begins to cause you to lose your memory you invent um, kind of false memories um, and a lot of the time her memories you say I'm sure I've, I'm sure I remember seeing that that incident in a film or on TV or something like that um, for instance she once said that the Queen Mother had um, pulled up and and you know in a chauffeur driven car and given her a, a lift um, you know, which I think is highly improbable, especially as she only mentioned that, you know, in her later years. But another thing that she mentioned in her later years, um, she spent the last couple of years of her life in Eastbourne um, and her flat looked out over the South Downs and she just used to sit there and stare out the window for a lot, a lot of the time. And she started saying, oh, I was, um, I was in an, an airfield over there in in the wafts you know i can remember um we were underground um working underground right over there on the south downs and you thought well never she never mentioned that ever before until she got to eastbourne um and it was probably just her, her, her imagination you know straying as she stared out the window but when I got oh look, there's another that's almost identical to the the the, the RAF control towers after 1939 were built to a standard um, plan, so they would have all looked like that. But that's identical to the model that I 3D printed. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I've lost my thread then. So so um, when I got a service record, it had a list of all the places that she'd served. Um, I'm not sure. Um, one of the places she was at was East Church, was which was a coastal command station um, on the Isle of Shappy. Um, so I'm not sure whether you know that you would be um, transferred from one command to another or not. Um, but anyway, she she the records showed that she served at this place uh, called Friston. Um, so I looked it up in here. I thought, oh, now I've got this book, I can look it up and see what it what it was about. Um, didn't even know that Frist, where Friston was, and lo and behold, 
Friston uh, was located Sussex, five miles west southwest of Eastbourne. So, in other words, that was the way her window faced. Um, present use agriculture, uh, fighter command. So, there you are. She she was in fighter command at that time. Um, opened 1940, closed 1946. Airstrip grass, control tower yes, lighting no. Um, hangers two blisters hard stands no accommodation temporary personnel 1400 and then the it reads uh, friston east dean or gales are all names associated with this base it was an unusual base as it was built on a hill it had two runways one long and one shorter in a wishbone shape the longer of the two was for emergency landings and the shorter for fighters friston opened in 1940 and closed in 1946 it was situated just in inland from Cookmere Haven and the Seven Sisters, east of the Cookmere River, on land belonging to Gales Farm and Exeat Farm. During the Second World War, it was a grass airfield used as a base for fighter aircraft of 11 Group, Royal Air Force Fighter Command, affiliated to the sector airfield of Biggin Hill. Friston was equipped with two blister aircraft hangars and temporary accommodation for base personnel, and was defended by several gun emplacements, Initially, the airfield functioned as an emergency landing ground and some upgrading of airfield facilities took place in 1942. Fighters from the site took place in the Dieppe Raid in 1942. In addition to its official resident fighter complement during 1943 to during 1943 to 1943, I don't know why they couldn't have just said during 1943, um, its geographical situation on the coast led it to receiving a large number of damaged bomber aircraft. The airfield was involved in supporting the D-Day landings and later for intercepting V-1 flying bombs. It is thought that aircraft would land at the top of the hill to down and take off in the opposite direction. So if it was on a hill, chances are, I mean she did describe everything being covered in turf and so on, so chances are um, she was indeed in a in a a building underground as it were so um there you go it's it's sad in a way just thinking of um you know how memory kind of leaves you but um often genuine memories can be um discredited i suppose um because most of your memory a person's memory is flawed doesn't mean to say that all of their memories aren't um, accurate. So, I think that is absolutely everything I've got to update you on. Thank you very much for watching, and see you on the next video. Bye for now.